Hello, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of The Casual Criminalist. I, as always, am your host, Simon. Welcome. This is the story, the tragedy, sorry, of Kitty Genovese, the silent witnesses. Um, this is written by Matt, the format of the show. If you've never been here before, Matt has written this for me. I've never read it before. We're going to explore it together and learn something. Although I've definitely heard of this case. It's quite famous, if I remember correctly. Anyway, Matt writes it. Let's jump in. Here's a fun question. What would you do if you were out and about or even at home just minding your own business and all of a sudden you heard someone screaming for help? <laughs> fun question there, Matt. It could be a man. It could be a woman. All you know is that they're yelling at the top of their lungs for aid. Or perhaps you just don't hear it, but you actually see it. Someone being attacked and in a bad way, clearly needing help. What would you do? Well, it depends. Like, obviously, the immediate answer is I would go to their aid. But it's also like... It's not such a simple answer because it's like if they're being like attacked by a group or someone who's really big and scary, I mean, you've got to call the police. I think that's the thing. But then beyond that, I don't really know what I would do. I don't have a gun. I don't have a weapons. <laughs> like, what am I supposed to do? Call the police is what I'd do. Just before we continue with today's video, I want to tell you about something that's been a game changer for so many guys out there, but not for me, because I am super bald, and that is Keeps. Now look, as I just said, I'm already bald, but some of you might be just going bald. You might be thinking you are going to go bald because your whole family is bald. This was me in my early 20s. And you might be thinking I'd like to have my hair a little bit longer, and that's where Keeps comes in. Look, if it was 10 years ago, oh god, 15 years ago now. <laughs> Yeah. I've been bored a long time. I'd be all over Keeps. It's an online subscription service that makes it super easy and affordable for men to tackle male pattern baldness from the comfort of their home. No more awkward doctor's visits or trip to the pharmacy. Just complete an online consultation and a licensed medical provider will tailor a treatment plan specifically for you. And the best part, they deliver the treatment right to your door in discreet packaging so you can, uh, just, uh, it's, it's just subtle, isn't it? It's nice that they to go to the doctor and the pharmacy and be like, yeah, yeah, no, just definitely losing my hair. <laughs> Nothing. You can choose delivery options of three, six, or 12 months, and you can adjust, pause, or cancel your plan anytime. Keeps offer clinically proven treatments that will stimulate hair growth. Plus, hair thickening shampoo, conditioner, and styling pomade make your hair look his best. God, it's been a long time since I've used any of that stuff. And here's a fun fact. Over the last six years, Keeps have treated over a million men. That's a lot of happy guys with great hair. Oh, rub it in. Why don't you Keeps with your ad copy? Thank you to Keeps for sponsoring this video. For a special offer to get started, go to Keeps.com slash Simon or click the link in the description below. That's K-E-E-P-S dot com slash Simon. And now back to today's video. Or on the flip side, what would you expect someone to do if you were in that situation? If you were in trouble, being attacked or something similar and you desperately needed help, if you were screaming for aid, would you expect someone to come to your help or call for help? If someone saw you were in trouble, would you expect them to come to your help to try and save you? If the answer is yes, then that's likely what most people would expect. Even in the messed up world we live in, we'd like to think that we would help should we hear that someone was in trouble. And if we were in trouble, we'd like to think that someone would come to our rescue. But what happens when a situation like this occurs? When someone cries for help? When someone hears those cries or even sees the evil deed being done and does nothing to help? It is with these questions and these examples that the darkness swallows us yet again. And I tell you the sad tale of a woman who needed rescuing, needed help, but her screams were unanswered, even when they were heard by many. How much of that initial story is the truth, though? How much is fiction? Well, I think it's time that we find out. This is the story of Kitty Genovese and how no one, allegedly, came to save her. Yes, this is familiar to me. I think I've even made a video at some point about why this case isn't quite as, like, egregious as people think. Like, oh my god, no one saved her. It wasn't, like, such a huge number of people hearing it or some such like that. Anyway, let's just, uh, a mask will explain it to us. Hello, dear kitty. So, let us start with the name that we should always remember from this travesty, the name of the victim, the name of the poor young woman who endured what she did not deserve to endure. Catherine Susan Genovese was born on the 7th of July 1935 to Italian-American parents Rachel Nee Giordano and Vincent Andrinelle Genovese in Brooklyn, New York City, New York. To her family and friends, she was known simply and lovingly as Kitty. 
The eldest of five children, they all lived together in a brownstone in the neighborhood of Park Slope, a place which mostly consisted of Irish and Italian folk. Raised in a traditional Catholic upbringing, Kitty attended the All Girl Prospects Heights High School, where she excelled in her English and music classes. Her graduating class elected her as the class cut up. I don't know what that is, which means that she was the class joker and loved to make jokes. Okay, we'd call that a class clown, I think. She was smart, she was a hard worker, and she was described by many to be a kind and caring girl, having a quote, sunny disposition, just an overall lovely girl living life in the Big Apple. Now, here's another fun question for you, Simon. Oh, God, it's not going to be fun, is it, man? I can already tell it's not going to be fun. What would you do as a father if you witnessed a murder firsthand in your neighborhood? If your answer was to pack up your shit, pack up your family, and move to a different location entirely, then you and Rachel Genovese have something in common. Um, you can't just pack up your family and your life. It's like, if this happens, I'll be like, oh, f that's really bad. But I can't move. In fact, there was a murder in my... I did move, but it was my old neighborhood. It was, but I live in the middle of a city. Some dude who was like having mental problems or whatever went into a government office and shot some like poor government worker because he believed that he was owed like benefits or something. And he wasn't. He was just like mentally unwell. And he shot this, this poor woman. Like it was two streets over from where I used to live. And, but you can't, just move house because someone got killed. That's because in 1954, Rachel witnessed a murder in proximity to where she and the rest of the family lived, so she insisted that the whole family should move far away for their own safety. Vincent agreed with his wife's wishes, and the whole family moved to New Canaan, Connecticut. All that is, except for Kitty. You see, Kitty had decided to stay in Brooklyn and would stay with her grandparents after the rest of her family had moved away. Rachel wasn't pleased about it. She wanted her daughter to come with them to be safe. But Kitty was insistent. She had just graduated high school, and she wanted to stay and continue preparing for her upcoming marriage to a man by the name of Rocco Antony Fazolari, an army officer and engineer. And so her family respected her wishes, allowing her to stay. Wait, she'd graduated high school, right? So she's 18. 19? Something like that? I guess it was a different time back in the day. But still, she's an autonomous adult. They'd very soon regret not making her come with them. Um, can they make an adult woman do anything? It's like we're moving to Cadetia. She'd be like, no. I'm getting married to this army engineer and officer. My life's sorted out. I don't need you, parents. You go live in fucking Connecticut, wherever that may be. I have no idea where Connecticut is. I get the feeling it's close to New York, but then it could also be in the Midwest for some reason. It's got Midwest vibes. I get the feeling that's completely wrong. Who knows? I mean, who knows? Every Literally every American watching this video, <laughs> listening to this podcast. I'm sorry. Kitty and Rocco would be married on October the 31st, 1954, but it wouldn't last long as the marriage was annulled by the end of the year and the couple would officially divorce in 1956. The reason? Because Kitty was actually a lesbian, but hey, love is love. Am I right? Love is love? I don't understand. Wait. <laughs> I don't understand what that is. It's, wait, should she have remained in love with Rocco? I'm confused. <laughs> From there, Kitty moved into an apartment on her own, living her best life in the big city, or at least that's what she wanted. She wanted to enjoy life, to be independent, hence why she stayed while her family moved away. She didn't have it easy, though, doing jobs she didn't enjoy to make ends meet. I think we all know that feeling, taking whatever job comes our way to get the money we need. It's depressing at times. Yes, yes, yes. I've worked some, like, not in a long time, but, like, I've worked some pretty miserable jobs where it's like, I'll oh, just pay me. <laughs> just pay me. I'm going to spend this money on happiness. In Kitty's case, it was a number of clerical jobs, sitting behind desks all day working as a secretary. Talk about unappealing, talk about boring. However, her dream was to open up an Italian restaurant, a business she could call her own, but for that, she needed money. She did eventually find a job she liked, though, oh, and she started working as a bartender in the late 1950s. Running a restaurant, uh, like, as a business, it's not something I envy. Everything you hear about running a restaurant is like, well, they all go out of business, it's really hard, and the profit margins are razor thin. I mean, like, that doesn't sound like a great business to be in. It just sounds mega stressful. And you you know, like, I don't know, I worked in a restaurant once in the kitchen, and it's like, it's it's not fun. It's not fun. It's just stressful. She did eventually find a job she liked, though, when she started working as a bartender in the late 1950s. Now, even with the job she enjoyed, it wasn't all sunshine and rainbows for Kitty. She still had her struggles, and she didn't exactly keep her nose clean either. It wasn't anything too serious, especially by cash crim standards, but she did get in trouble with the law in August 1961 for bookmaking. Oh, wait, wait, like being a person people gamble with? <laughs> okay, you do you, you hustle that shit. 
Basically, she was a bookie. In Kitty's case, she'd been taking bets on horse races from bar patrons. This is, from how it sounds, illegal. And when she was found out, she and a friend of hers named D. Guarnieri were put under arrest and each fined $50, equivalent to $490 in 2024. That sounds like a pretty light fine. I'm sure she made more money than that doing the gambling. After that little bump in the road, though, her life started to pick up. She got herself another bartending job, this time at Ev's 11th Hour Bar on Jamaica Avenue and 193rd Street in Hollis, Queens. She worked her butt off, showing her skills and capabilities, and soon took up the role of managing the bar since the owner was always absent. Working double shifts, she started earning more and more money, and her dream of opening a restaurant got closer to fruition. She was making good money, too. Roughly $750 a month, which is $6,800 a month today. God damn. That's not bad for being a bar. I guess she's working double shifts, but still, that's pretty good money. Maybe not good money in New York, but New York City, I mean. But still, 68000 What is that? It's like over 70 grand a year. That is 70 grand a year. That's not bad. And on top of that, she found herself a girlfriend. This was Mary Ann Zylonko, and the two of them had met on March 13, 1963 at Swing Rendezvous, an underground lesbian bar in Greenwich Village. They fell hard for each other, becoming a couple almost immediately, and they decided to move in together, getting a new apartment on the second floor of a two-story building next to the Long Island Railroad, LIRR, in Kew Gardens, Queens, New York. Because of the stigma against gay and lesbian couples back in the day, which ridiculously still happens in some places today, yes, for sure, like, it's like, it, you see, oh yeah, we've come so far since the 60s, it's like, yeah, yeah, there's still a way to go, isn't there? So they had to play at being roommates. However, they loved each other very much, and they wanted to walk the long road of life together. Life was on the up and up, and things oh, were finally falling into place. Kitty oh, was finally happy and moving towards her dream. Things couldn't get any better, but it didn't last for long in the dead of night. The night of March 13th, 1964, was a night like any other. Though, aren't they all? You go out to work, going about your day and night, thinking about it as just another normal day. You never think that that day, that night, would be the final night of your life. Full disclosure here, Simon and dear audience, this section here will cover the incident as it was initially reported and covered by the authorities and the media and is the most well-known version of the attack. It was 2.30 in the morning on March 13, 1964, and Kitty had just gotten off her shift at the bar. Another busy night, another successful night, and she was ready to head home to celebrate her and Mary's one-year anniversary. That honestly makes what's about to come even worse. Kitty got into her red Fiat and began her journey home, arriving at 3.15 a.m. People drive in New York City? In every movie, they're just thinking they're either super rich and being driven around in the back of a Mercedes, they're taking taxis, or they're on the pu on public transport. Parking a car in the Kew Gardens Long Island Railroad Station parking lot, she was mere 100 feet, 30 meters from home, and the door to her apartment building was in sight. All she had to do was make her way down the alleyway at the rear of the building and head inside. And that's when it happened. You see, while on her way home, Kitty had no idea that the darkness had an agent out on the prowl that night. He was hunting for a victim, and unfortunately, he had spotted her. He looked at her, her face bright with excitement despite being tired after work, and he knew, he knew he needed to claim her life. And so, he followed Kitty back to her apartment complex, parking his vehicle at the corner bus stop on Austin Street. Getting out of the car, hunting knife in hand, he stalked towards her. Kitty spotted him before he could sneak up on her, and seeing the knife, made a run for the front of the building. Unfortunately, Kitty wasn't fast enough. Her attacker caught up to her and plunged the knife into her back two times. Kitty let out a cry of pain and screamed for help. Oh my god, he stabbed me. Please help me. Please help me. The area around them was quiet and desolate, with almost all residents in the vicinity being sound asleep in bed. But that only seemed to intensify the volume of Kitty's cries, which did grab the attention of one man. This was Robert Moser, one of Genovese's neighbors. Her screams woke him up from his slumber. Shambling over to the window, he saw the struggle down below. Opening the window, Robert stuck his head out and cried, let that girl alone! With attention now on him, the assailant took off into the night, leaving Kitty bleeding from the back and struggling to stand. Kitty valiantly willed her body to move and managed to pull and drag her body to the other side of the building toward the main entrance. Once inside the main vestibule area, she collapsed from the pain, blood loss, and exhaustion. Time passed, and all the while Kitty was left there, barely conscious and bleeding, in a hallway in the back of the building. She had moved out of sight of the original attack, so Robert wasn't even sure where she'd gone. But even then, no one came to see if she was all right. And ten minutes later, her attacker came back. I guess the thing, this Robert guy, he probably didn't, he was awoken by her screams. So he probably didn't hear that she's been stabbed. He just seemed probably scared off the attacker. And he was like, and he was like jobs are good, eh? 
<laughs> Which I mean, in retrospect, not enough. But in the moment, probably fine. It'd be like, oi, leave her, leave her alone. And then the guy leaves her alone. And then you're like, cool, job done. Fair enough. Because I don't think he knows more. He was thin and on the shorter side. And he was an African-American man with a gaunt and slender face. Only this time, he was wearing a wide-brimmed hat in an attempt to conceal his features. Wasting no time, he took the hunting knife out once again, stabbed her 11 more times, sexually assaulted her in the hallway of her building, stole the $49 she had on her person, and then simply walked off into the night. The entire thing lasted a total of 30 minutes. Kitty's friend and neighbor, Sophia Farrar, discovered her there, bloody and violated, in the same position she was left in by her attacker. Injuries to her hand suggested that the entire time she was being attacked, she was trying to fight him off, fighting for her life. Exactly how it happened is still hazy, but multiple neighbors claimed that they had called the police and an ambulance at around 3.50 a.m. after the attack was already over. They were there in two minutes, but an ambulance wouldn't arrive until 4.15, an extra 30 minutes after the attack had finished. Sophia stayed by Kitty's side, holding her, consoling her the entire time, never leaving her once the ambulance arrived, whispering to her reassuringly, Help is on the way. Kitty was loaded up into the ambulance, which started making its way towards Queen's General Hospital. It was all for naught, though. Kitty had been stabbed 13 times, and it was all too much. Kitty Genovese, at only 28 years old, passed away in the back of the ambulance before she could arrive at the hospital. She was buried three days later in Lakeview Cemetery in New Canaan, Connecticut, where her family now lived. The Man in the Dark To say that the investigation wasn't off to a good start is an understatement. The police questioned a number of people in the area, but only two other people besides Robert and Sophia came forward. One man named Carl Ross admitted that instead of calling for the police first thing, he called his friends for advice on what to do before actually calling the authorities. He'd been intoxicated that night and opened his door to see what all the ruckus was about. Ross actually saw the killer plunge his knife down into her before quickly retreating into his apartment and shutting the door, scared stiff. His quote on the whole matter... I didn't want to get involved. Fine, don't get involved. Phone the police rather than yo, yo, Mike. Hey, hey, Mike. Yeah, yeah. It's it's what was his name? What was his name? Yeah, yeah. It's Carl. I just saw a woman in my the hallway in my building. A, a dude like plunged a knife into her. Do you think I should call the cops? <laughs> yes, Carl. Yes, now. Mary was also questioned by Detective Mitchell Sang at 7 a.m., mere hours after the attack. She was clearly heartbroken over the death of her girlfriend, the woman she wanted to spend all her life with. It didn't take long for police to realize that she wasn't a suspect and she had no involvement with the death of Kitty. You know what they did do, though? Kept her in questioning and grilled her for six hours straight. Specifically, it was two homicide detectives, John Carroll and Jerry Burns, who conducted this specific line of questioning. On what, you may be asking? Why, oh, about a relationship with Kitty, what else? Because the past was the worst and prejudice against gay people is stupid. It didn't take long, though, before the killer was captured. Six days after the attack and Kitty's death, a man by the name of Raoul Cleary noticed another man removing a television from the back of one of his neighbor's vehicles in the Queen's neighborhood of Ozone Park. Suspicious, Cleary confronted the man, a short and slender African-American man with a thin face. Sounding familiar? This was 29-year-old Winston Mosley, a married man with three children and no criminal record to speak of. He was from Ozone Park, he was a local, and he worked at Remington Rand as a tab operator. What is a tab operator? Preparing the punched cards used at the time mainly for data input for digital computers. Oh, there you go. That is a job that doesn't exist anymore. Mosley told Cleary that he was a mover and that the owner of the house was moving and he was simply doing his job. Cleary didn't buy it though. He's like, no, 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 mate. That's my neighbor's guy. He's not moving anywhere. What are you doing? Or it'd be better, even better, he's like, well, I don't think so because that's my car, my dude. <laughs> Cleary didn't buy it, though. Mosley was a local, and he would have known Mosley was no mover. And so Cleary went to consult another neighbor named Jack Brown, who confirmed that Mosley was speaking nonsense. Thinking fast, Cleary called the police while Brown disabled Mosley's car to keep him from getting away. Nice work, everybody. The police arrived soon enough, and they took note of Mosley's vehicle, a white Chevrolet Corvair. A car of similar make and color. You know, it's weird. I literally saw a Chevrolet Corvair the other day. An old, like, properly old corvair that was just in a parking garage like i went to a shopping center parked on my car and there was like a properly old chevrolet corvair right there i only remember it because i remember the, the the name on the back being corvair and i was like i've never heard of this before it's a giant car and it was just sitting there covered in dust and i'm like whose car is this why is it left here what's going on a car of similar make and color was reported by some of the witnesses to have been spotted in the area specifically driving off and then quickly returning within a 10 minute time frame and when he returned he was wearing a dark white brimmed hat 
Mosley's car was searched, the television was found, and Winston Mosley was arrested for suspected robbery and was taken in for questioning. It's right about now that we'd expect the usual in situations like this. Yes, Mosley would deny it, he'd cry for innocence and freedom, and we'd move on from there, right? Well, actually, no, not in this case. Winston Mosley willingly confessed to the murder of Kitty Genovese, as well as the murder of two other women that the police were investigating at the time. Holy sh! Okay, where's your lawyer at, dude? The first, 15-year-old Barbara Kralik, she'd been murdered the previous June in a parent's Springfield Gardens home, and the second was Annie Mae Johnson, who had been shot and burned to death in her apartment in South Ozone Park a few weeks earlier. He also admitted to between 30 and 40 burglaries around that same time. Detectives Carol and Zhang were immediately contacted, and they came to question Mosley personally. They spoke with him about that night, and he didn't hold back. When asked about why he attacked and killed Kitty, Mosley minced no words. He simply said that his goal was to kill a woman, and that night he was determined to do so. His wife was a nurse, and she worked the night shift, so he wasn't worried about being caught. He was stalking the streets, keeping an eye out for any and all victims. He simply wanted to murder a woman. He didn't care who she might be, and that's when he spotted Kitty. Deciding she was the one, he followed her home, stabbed her twice, retreated, only to come back minutes later, sexually assaulted her, stabbed her some more, stole what little money she had on hand, and then left, headed home for the night to get some sleep. And when asked why that was, he stated that he preferred to kill women because they were easier and didn't fight back. This guy is a total psycho. What a monster. What a psycho. Yes, Matt and I, same page. Winston Mosley was arrested and charged with the murder of Kitty Genovese, and his trial began on the 8th of June 1964 and was presided over by Judge J. Owen Shapiro. He wasn't charged with the two other murders that he'd admitted to, though, mostly because another man, Alvin Mitchell, had also confessed the murder of Barbara Kralik. Mosley pleaded not guilty at first, despite having admitted to everything and going into great detail about the whole thing, but that soon changed. At his lawyer's insistence, his plea was changed to not guilty by reason of insanity. Even then, when the jury heard how he killed her, why he did what he did, and the utter lack of empathy, remorse, or sadness in his voice, he never stood a chance. Yeah, good, he's a psycho needs to go to prison. On June 11, 1964, only three days after the trial had begun, the judge and jury had heard enough. Winston Mosley was found guilty, and four days later, on June 15, he was sentenced to death. Some in attendance were over the moon with this sentence, so much so that they even applauded and cheered the courtroom. Mosley, though, he simply stood there, not moving, not speaking, showing no emotion on his face at all. In response to the horrid things that had been done, and the total lack of remorse throughout the trial, and even his death sentence, Judge Shapiro had no sympathies for Mosley. Quoting him here, I don't believe in capital punishment, but when I see a monster like this, I wouldn't hesitate to pull the switch myself. <laughs> Sounds like you do believe in capital punishment. It's kind of like the, the same way I believe in capital punishment. Do I think it should exist? No. For this? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's like, no, you do really believe in it. Don't you? Just like me. After the trial, Mosley even appeared on June the 23rd, 1964, as defense witness in the trial of Alvin Mitchell for the murder of Barbara Kralik. This was, of course, after being granted immunity from prosecution. Well, does he want immunity from prosecution? Because it sounds like if he's going to be prosecuted for that, it might be the one thing that's going to buy him more time in prison before he is killed. It did lead to a hung jury, but a second trial was ordered, and Mitchell was convicted despite Mosley's terrible testimony. Mosley stayed on death row for a few years, but that all changed on June the 1st, 1967. That day, the New York Court of Appeals found that Mosley should have been able to argue that he was medically insane at the sentencing hearing when the trial court found that he had been legally sane. Because of this, his sentence was reduced to life imprisonment with the possibility of parole. Yes. Really. Um, no, uh, uh, fine. I, look, this guy is a monster, a horrible psycho, is convicted for killing one person. Do I think he should be sentenced to death? I don't know, man. It's really hard. But should he be in prison forever without p -p parole? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Jailbird Mosley. It took less than a year before things went tits up when it came to Mosley. On March the 18th, 1968, Mosley was taken to Mayor Memorial Hospital in Buffalo, New York, after he had injured himself while in prison. They got him all patched up and were on their way back to the prison when he made his move. Knocking down the transporting correctional officer, Mosley stole his weapon, jumped from the vehicle, and escaped. From there, he fled to a nearby house owned by Mr. and Mrs. Matthew Kalaga. That's a very old way of doing things, isn't it? Mr. and Mrs. Matthew Kalaga. It's like, I remember, I, I, the first time I saw this, I think, was on a wedding invitation that I got. And it was like Mr. and Mrs. first name, surname of the, the man. And I'm like, what? Since when is this a thing? And it's like, oh, no, it's just a really old school thing. <laughs> it feels very ownative, doesn't it? Uh, ownative, that's not a word. Like, possessive. 
Thankfully for them, they weren't at home at that time, and he stayed undetected for three whole days. Then, on March the 21st, the Kalugas came home. They simply wanted to check in on the house. No fuss, no muss. But instead, they ran into Winston Mosley. He bound and gagged both of them, held them hostage for over an hour, and sexually violated Mrs. Kaluga. Afterwards, Mosley took their vehicle and left. From there, he traveled to Grand Island, an island town in the Erie County, New York. There, he broke into another house, held the mother and daughter who lived there hostage for two hours, and let them go unharmed before surrendering to the police shortly afterwards. Just another example of escaped prisoners being right back in prison shortly after escaping, which is by far the most common outcome. Like prison breaks, you're back in prison real soon afterwards. Charged with escape and kidnapping, Mosley pled guilty and was given two additional 15-year sentences to run concurrently with his life sentence. He's not getting out of prison anymore. <sighs> Things were quiet for a couple of years when it came to Mosley. No incidents, no news, and nothing much going on until 1971. On September the 9th, 1971, all hell broke loose for four days straight. The prison was locked in a state of chaos with the Attica prison riot. That's an entirely different video, arguably for this channel or another, but let's just say it was a clusterf where in the end, 33 inmates and 10 correctional officers and employees were dead. God damn, that's a prison riot and a half. Mosley was part of the chaos, but did survive the ordeal. Hell, he even went on to obtain a Bachelor of Arts in Sociology in prison from Niagara University. Okay, then. I mean, good for him. Now, with that being said, I'm all for rehabilitation. I'm all for wanting to better yourself, even from behind bars. But for me, that also requires you to have a soul, which Mosley clearly lacked. You see, in 1984, Winston Mosley became eligible for parole for the first time. So let me ask you something real quick, Simon. Knowing what you know about this waste of skin, what do you think you told the parole board? I think he told the parole board that I'm really sorry for the crime. I admitted to it straight away. Um, I've been a good boy in prison, except for the riots and the escape. <laughs> uh, please let me go. And hopefully the parole board's like, no, 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 no. You stay in prison forever where you belong, you psycho. Well, how about literally saying that he was a victim in all of this too because he was made to stay in prison for what he did? That's a crazy argument. Quote, for a victim outside, it's a one-time or one-hour or one-minute affair, but for the person who's caught, it's forever. That is an insane argument. Maybe you should have not done a degree in sociology, but should have done a degree in law, because then you'd have some idea about what the f*** you're talking about. Well, how about this? How about him claiming that he hadn't originally intended to kill and rape Kitty, it was simply a mugging gone wrong, and that people do kill people when they mug them sometimes? Uh, yeah, dude. Like, what the f***? It's like, oh, well, I was just going to mug her, and then, uh, yeah, no, I just did a, a little bit of sexual assault and murder on the side. Didn't mean to. It just kind of happened. The sexual assault? Like, what the fuck? Needless to say, Mosley didn't receive parole that day, or any other day for that matter. Year after year, he continued to try and get let out, and year after year, he was denied, showing no remorse or empathy for his actions at any time. He got all the way up to attempt number 18 in November 2015, but was denied once again. Winston Mosley, age 81, died in prison on March 28, 2016, having served 52 years, making him one of the longest-serving inmates in New York State prison system. Excellent! Glad to hear that he died in prison, where he belongs! And with that, we have the end of the story as it pertains to the crime itself. As for what crime came about afterwards and because of it, well, let's get into that. The Bystander Effect in Aftermath So, why is this a case that has stuck in the public consciousness for over 50 years, and why is it taught in detail in criminal justice courses? I'd first need to specify that the case didn't originally get much attention. It was simply another murder in the Big Apple, no more, no less. But then Abraham Michael, A.M. Rosenthal, Metropolitan Editor of the New York Times, got a hold of the story. He was having lunch with New York City Police Commissioner Michael J. Murray and was told about the case. To say he ran with it is a bit of an understatement. On March 27, 1964, two weeks after the murder, the Times published an article written by Martin Gansberg and overseen by Rosenthal. The headline, 37 who saw murder didn't call police, and right underneath, apathy at stabbing of Queenswoman shocks inspector. It went into great detail about the travesty that befell Kitty, how she was stalked and brutally attacked by Mosley, how she cried out for help, and how nobody of 37 witnesses came to rescue her. Originally, it was meant to claim that 38 people had witnessed the attack, and the headline was later changed in future reprints. In an excerpt from the original article, it read, For more than half an hour, 38 respectable law-abiding citizens in Queens watched a killer stalk and stab a woman in three separate attacks in Kew Gardens. Not one person telephoned the police during the assault. One witness called after the woman was dead. Wait, that's already, it's not quite out. Right, were there really 38 people and also three separate attacks? I thought it was two. And it was kind of one attack, just with two parts. Now, they couldn't be held criminally responsible as there wasn't a duty of care. A spokesperson even confirmed that at the time. 
but morally, people simply couldn't believe it. In the wake of the article, the duty of Kitty's death and the silent witnesses became a hot topic for a while. A follow-up article to the original was soon published, examining why witnesses wouldn't help. Rosenthal even wrote a book on the subject entitled 38 Witnesses, The Kitty Genovese Case. And as stated, it's still talked about and even studied today. Because of it, a new theory cropped up, namely by psychologists Bib Latan and John Darley. The bystander effect, also known as Kitty Genovese syndrome, suggests that people in a crowd are less likely to intervene in a crime than a single eyewitness. The theory began to be taught in schools, in psychology and criminal law courses, and still is to this day. Kitty's case itself is also taught in schools, with psychologists suggesting that it was more useful to point to a single person in a crowd and demand help than to ask the entire crowd for assistance. The theory is sound, and it makes sense. Hell, to be fair, I think we've all come into contact with situations where this even applies to us. How many times have we seen something going down while out and about or while in our neighborhoods and just walked away? Not our problem. Someone else will deal with it. Would you and I do any difference? Or would we feel more inclined to help if we were singled out and asked directly for aid? It's more common than I think we even realize. Yeah, you'd definitely be more if someone was like, help me, please. You, there, bald man with the beard. I'd be like, okay, <laughs> yes. I'm right here. No one else is helping. You've chosen me. Another perfect example of this. Ten years later, on December the 25th, 1974, the same thing happened again, and in the exact same location nonetheless. This was the case of 25-year-old model Sandra Zala. Early Christmas morning at 3.20 a.m. in an apartment that overlooked the same site where Kitty was killed, she was beaten to death. She was heard screaming in pain and calling out for help by multiple people in the apartments around hers, but no one came, and no one did anything, let alone call the police. Hell, her body wasn't even found until the next day at 2 in the afternoon when 24-year-old George Bugerslaw, Sandra's boyfriend, let himself into her apartment. It makes sense. It fits well. But did the bystander effect, in the case that brought it to light in the first place, even come into effect? Apparently not. After Winston Mosley passed away, it was revealed that the Times had grossly exaggerated the number of people who had seen or heard Kitty getting attacked. And of those that did, did they try to intervene? Robert Mosier? Well, he cried out to Mosley to leave Kitty alone. Mosley fled, and Kitty moved out of sight, after which Robert didn't know what happened, let alone the Mosley came back. Sophia Farrar? Well, she heard Kitty being attacked and rushed down to help without even knowing what was happening or who was being attacked even. As we know, she stayed with Kitty until the moment the police and ambulance arrived, saying that she would be okay. And any other person who heard? They thought it was a domestic dispute, something normal, something mundane, and if they had known the extent of it, they might have intervened sooner. Hell, Kitty's own brother, Bill Genovese, went to investigate for the documentary The Witness. He caught up with A.M. Rosenthal and asked him about it, and when the topic of the 38 silent witnesses came up, Rosenthal had this to say, quote, I can't swear to God that there were 38 people. Some people say there were more, some people say there were less. What was true, people all over the world were affected by it. Did it do anything? You bet your eye it did something, and I'm glad it did. Well, he's certainly not wrong, but a journalist exaggerating to sell a story? I mean, shock horror. And in the end, to this day, this has been added to the bottom of the original story. Quote, October the 12th, 2016, later reporting by The Times and others, has called into question significant elements of this account. <laughs> Since then, many people understand that while it wasn't enough to save her life, Kitty did have people on her side looking out for her. Could they have done more? Of course. But it wasn't a gross display of mass ignorance that cost Kitty her life, but the deplorable acts and demented urges of a sick man in a wide-brimmed hat. And hell, if there's one other good thing that came out of this whole affair, it's that this was one of, if not the case, that made possible the creation of 911 here in the States. And the rest, as they say, is history, with countless lives saved as a result. Wrap up. And with that, our story comes to an end. It's a sad one, one that didn't need to happen, and one that could indeed have been stopped had more people acted quicker. I'll admit, I've known about this case for a very long time. It just took me forever to get to it. It's fascinating, it's heartbreaking, and the ramifications are still being felt to this day. 911, the bystander effect, these things are in use today, and they're being used to help so many people so they don't end up like Kitty did in the end, on the wrong side of the madman's blade. A sick man an evil man. Winston Mosley was a man who simply wanted to kill for the feeling of killing. He went out hunting that night. He wanted to kill someone, a woman preferably, simply because it made him feel good, strong, and like he was in control. We don't know much about anything about his past, at least not that I found, but regardless, it's no excuse. He was a monster, one that felt no empathy or remorse, and he died behind bars where he deserved to be. With that, we simply remember Kitty. Catherine Genovese was a bright and passionate young lady. She had a good future ahead of her, with a family who loved her, a girlfriend who adored her, and a dream that was almost a reality. All of that was taken away from her, but even today she's remembered. 
It's a tragedy that she had to die, but her impact resounds throughout the world even today. And in the end, it's good to know that she wasn't totally alone. It wasn't 38 people simply ignoring her, letting her be violated and killed. It was a misunderstanding of the situation. It was the lack of a direct line to the authorities and the evil actions of an evil man. Robert Mosier called out to help her, and Sophia Farrar was there with her all the way until the end, soothing her through the pain until it was over. To them, even though they're already gone from this world, I say thank you, and rest in peace, Kitty. And that is the end of today's episode. Thank you so much for being here. If you did enjoy it, please do make sure you leave a review. Like and subscribe if you're watching on YouTube, and I'll see you next time.